Papa, I'm hungry. Papa, I'm hungry and I'm so cold. Can I have another can? I'm not your papa. For the last time, I'm not your papa. But papa, please, I'm hungry. There is no more food. More food, papa? Again, you ate the last can of food three days ago. Yeah, whatever. That's it. We're dead. Dead. It's the end of the line, and it's your fault. We still got all that ketchup? Yeah. It's in the bag somewhere. Why are you looking at me that way? And don't worry about it. Isn't it just about your bedtime, old man? Yeah, I guess I am kind of tired. Hey, uh, just wanted to jump in here real quick. I know what you're thinking. Uh, this entire read-along, you've been nothing but salty little pricks. And how are you going to top that uh, in a review? And the answer, the simple, the real answer is simply, we're not. Uh, we're not going to top that energy. So we brought in the saltiest prick that we know. And following our review here on the channel, uh, appended to the end of this video will be the review of Steve Donahue. So I hope that you stay through this review and you keep along this ride in order to see the saltiest prick that BookTube has to offer. That works. Welcome to Shirt Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I'm Adrian Fort. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we're here for the review of The Road, which is the fourth part in a fourth part series. The first three parts of the series being a read-along for The Road. But this part is the review. You alright? No. I don't like where this is going. This could get ugly. Uh, the Road by Cormac McCarthy. Yes. Yeah. We've got three good things, three bad things, quotes, literary analysis, rating, and recommendation based on the text. But first, we start with the simple question, so, what happened? The road. That's pretty much it. Uh, this is the story of a man and his son traveling south. No, 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 no. no. You're already wrong. This is the story of the man and, and the boy. And the son. And the boy, excuse me. Uh, they are traveling south along the road because... Something is south that will make this better. We're in a post-apocalyptic world. They suffer a lot. They have their ups and downs. And they get south. And the man dies. That's pretty much it. You're, you're short-selling a little bit. There are times where they go east or west. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes they leave the road for brief moments. But they always get back on that road. Uh, hot garbage. Just hot garbage. It's not good. Yeah. Three good things, three bad things? Three good things, go. Okay. Uh, this was hard <laughs> to yeah. get three good things. I honestly struggled with this. So this is one of those books that the formula part of the review is is terse. It was it was brutal. But the analysis part will be the, the meat of things. I will say, though, uh, Dan, if you want to talk about dark, uh, there's, a, there's a lot that crosses a lot of moral lines in this. Uh, it, it does have some chutzpah in, in that aspect where uh, it makes you think. It gets a little dark from time to time. Uh, number two... This text forces you to place yourself into the story. It adds a lot of those what-will-you-do questions. I've talked about that for a few weeks now. Uh, but it does a good job of putting yourself into the story, the reader into the story. And number three, though you disagree, occasionally McCarthy has a very beautiful moment. A fleeting, pretty line that's just wasted. Yeah, if you were coming across just the review part of this... Uh, head back to part three of the read-along where I a little bit berate Dalton because this is just uh, this is just pretentious writing. It's not good writing. So, three good things. This is a quick read. Fair. You are, at least, forced to contemplate. Fair. And three, the man dies. Spoilers. 
you know, I usually like a story where somebody dies. I always say, you know, a good story always has somebody who dies in it. You gotta have somebody. No. Did you like the man? Did I like the man? I was indifferent about the man. It's better off he's dead. I was indifferent about the whole fucking thing. Yeah. This all could have never happened and I wouldn't have cared. Yeah. Let's talk about bad things, though. Go ahead. Uh, dear Lord, this just fucking drags on. There's so much uh, staccato in the writing. It's just choppy and it just never ends. As quick as a read as it is, it just feels grueling to get through it. Number two, this is so fucking unrealistic. Uh, suspension of disbelief is out the window because, no, uh, this has to be hyper-realistic. We talked about that a little last week, too, and it's not. It's unrealistic. And number three, <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> that resolution and that ending is hot fucking garbage. Everything's fine. That's fine. We got there. It's fine. No big deal. Just moving on. Even though they didn't really Shouldn't be anymore. fine in this yeah. world. Shouldn't be fine. It just fucking ends. And nobody changes. Nothing changes. It just fucking ends. Boy finds a new family. Moves on with life. Yeah. Anyway. Yours. Number one. This is definitionally pretentious. Number two. This novel employs the bad type of mystery. And number three... I cannot visualize this world, and for a post-apocalyptic world that has been thrown through hell such as this, being able to visualize the world is of utmost import. It is critical. Uh, you are painting a picture with this, you are world building with this, and it is not done successfully. Yeah. Uh, unless you've got a great taste for the color gray, then you yeah. know what's exactly what's going but on. But you don't even know that, because there's times where they're walking through fields that are obviously grass. Yeah. So you it's don't just, know... It's just gray. Yeah. Everything's gray. There's yeah. like 50 shades of gray. Yeah. Yeah. 50 shades of the road. 50 shades of the road. Anyway. You've got quotes. I do have quotes. I, I, I do actually like this quote here. You're going to tell me it's pretentious. 114. It's pretentious. <laughs> they lay listening. Can you do it when the time comes? When the time comes, there will be no time. Now is the time. Curse God and die. What if it doesn't fire? It has to fire. What if it doesn't fire? Could you crush that beloved skull with a rock? I could. Is there such a being within you of which you know nothing? Can there be? Hold him in your arms, just so. The soul is quick. Pull him towards you. Kiss him. Quickly. I like it. You're going to tell me it's pretentious, but I like it. Yes, it's bad. And that's like really the only quote that I got. got. I've got a couple others, but like they're not worth reading. Um, there was a good moment of pain here right towards the end that I think could be highlighted. Uh, he slept close to his father that night and held him, but when he woke in the morning, his father was cold and stiff. He sat there a long time weeping, and then he got up and walked out through the woods to the road. When he came back, he knelt beside his father and held his cold hand and said his name over and over again. It's not great by any means, but uh, it's a good moment of suffering. At least there's something going on with that. Uh, do you have any quotes whatsoever, anything at all? I have a thought on quotes here. Fuck me, please. I believe that all art forms, all forms of art, as well as all intellectual pursuits, as well as all pursuits of beauty, can feed off of one another. That's why, personally, one of the texts which played a large part in my development as a writer is a, a biography of Einstein. Okay. Because you were presented with how this guy worked. In this, I believe that writers can take much from great painters as well. Painting is a pursuit of art. It is a pursuit of beauty. Writers can learn from that. Leonardo da Vinci, for example, is a okay. painter from which I think artists can learn, for writers can learn something. Uh, do you know the technique which Leonardo used to give his paintings such a demure type of brilliance? I do not. It's called sfumato. I know I'm saying that wrong. S-F-U-M-A-T-O. It means that there are very few distinctive, definitive lines in the work. The painting has a smoky ambiance to it, uh, much like your vision. You don't see hard lines between things all the time. Uh, vision is how you look at the real world. Nothing is outlined, right? Okay. In a way, it is like hiding the work. It is obfuscating the labor involved. All of the preparation without telling on yourself. Okay. That is what is going, that is what is at stake when you're talking about sfumato. 
you're not telling on yourself in the work you've done, the labor that has been put into it. McCarthy, however, in this novel, telegraphs every move he's about to make. And you see the author on the page. And for that, I can give him no credit. There are no good quotes. No quotes. No good quotes. First time we've ever had no quotes. I think this is the first time I've had no quotes. Okay. At least you justified it. Yeah. You gave it a reason. Yeah. Now, Adrian, where do you want to start with this? Because well, there's been a lot of buildup. We've been talking about this for a week now. Where are we going? I've got one point to make before I get into the master type thesis analysis I've got for this thing. Do you have anything before yours? I, I, there was a little bit of conversation, and we did tackle a lot of it last week. Uh, the idea of, you know, what separates us from a, the idea of a monster. Uh, what gives us humanity. Uh, where is that moral line? Because that's crossed a lot in this. Uh, we see the bad guys, as they're quoted, have crossed that moral line. And our good guys seem to hold some of that morality. Uh, they seem to have that fire within them. Don't get into that yet. Yes. That's the main thrust, right? That, yeah, that's our main thrust. But so yeah, th I didn't read your notes before this, but we sort of... I showed you yours, you showed me your mo yours. I showed you mine, you showed me yours, and we compared the length, right? Yes. So the main thrust of this argument, I would request I make it through mine... Because I guarantee you they're not exactly the same. No. So I will make it through mine, and then you tell me where you counter. Okay. Would that, would that be okay? Let's do that. Um, but first, before we get into that main thrust, I think what happened here, this apocalyptic event, was the eruption of Yellowstone. Okay. I think that's what's going on here. I think that's what is being inferred. Which, back in November, the imminent threat of this occurrence was bumped to high. Turns out that it will be the United States that ends the world after all. But the main thrust here, I believe, for me begins with Elijah. We meet Elijah on the road. Okay. Elijah is the name of an Old Testament prophet. What does his name mean? Go on. Yahweh is my God. Uh, miracles were also performed through Elijah. Did you know that much? I did not. In one of these miracles, Elijah, while traveling, asks a woman to feed him. This woman denies him. Says, I barely have enough food for me and my son. Mm. Elijah says, come on, lady, look. You feed me, God will provide for you. So, she feeds him, and God does just that. Elijah is also the only person that we ever see return to Mount Horeb. I know I'm saying that wrong. Do you know what Mount Horeb is? No. That is from whence Moses got the Ten Commandments. Okay. While Elijah is here, God speaks directly to him. God says, hey, what the hell are you doing here? And Elijah, do you remember Elijah on the road? I do. Elijah in the Bible... When God says, hey, what the hell are you doing here? Sort of dances around it. He does not answer definitively. He's very coy. And there was a terrible wind. But God was not the wind. There was an earthquake. But God is not an earthquake. There was fire. Fire. There was fire. But God is not fire. Then a still small voice came to Elijah and it said, Elijah. Hey, what the hell are you doing here? And Elijah says, Look, pal, I'm the only one still doing your stuff. I'm the only one carrying the fire, perhaps. The man and the boy find Elijah. And the man and the boy find luck. They ask Elijah all sorts of questions, and Elijah is evasive and like, Oh my God, super evasive and mysterious. OMG. Ooh. The man and the boy are carrying the fire, right? Okay. In the beginning, God created the heaven and earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Well, light comes from heat, heat from fire. 
Um, light, then, is the beginning of all things life. In that little bit of the Bible that we all recognize, in the beginning, there, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. What I just read was Genesis 1 through 3. Okay. Genesis 20 reads as such. Do you need to move them for dramatic effect? No, I need to move them because you're going to pick up your book in a second. And God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature, hath, the moving creature that hath life. This is, I believe, the fourth day. How long did the boy stay with the man when he was dead? Was it three or four? It was three days. Three days. Which means that he went forth on the fourth day. On the fourth day in Genesis, I believe this is the fourth day in Genesis. And God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creatures that hath life. Read, if you would be so kind, the final paragraph of this book. <clears throat> From here? Yes. <sighs> Once there were brook trout in the streams and the mountains. You could see them standing in the amber current, where the white edges of their fins wimpled softly in the flow. They smelled of moss in your hand, polish and muscular and torsional. I hope I said it right. Torsional. Torsional. Uh, on their backs were vermiculate patterns that were maps of the world and its becoming. Maps and mazes of a thing which could not be put back. Not be made right again. In the deep glens where they all lived, all things were older than man, and they hummed of mystery. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. But we still have the problem of the fire. Okay. This seems to be a third covenant, yes? We still have the problem of the fire. The new covenant, the second covenant, gives us a creation myth as well, in the form of John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the beginning of the beginning was the Word, but in the beginning of life was light. Light is heat, light is fire. The Word is in the fire. The beginning of the beginning was the Word. The beginning of the beginning is God. Okay. God said, let there be light. His words created light. Light is fire. The Word is fire. I think we're starting to mesh at this point. Yeah, so the beginning of the beginning was the Word. The beginning of us was light. Light is heat. Light, uh, heat is fire. The Word is the fire. Many translations of, an, of this interpretation of John point to the Word, translated from Logos, to be a reference to Christ. The Christ. These two carry with them Christ. Yep. Christ is hope. Christ is the Son. Yep. Christ is God, but He is not the Son God. He is the Son of God. Christ is, as Son, the next generation. But that doesn't make sense, does it? How does the eternal have a next generation? God is eternal. How does he have a son to carry forth the myth, to carry forth however you see it? The next generation of the eternal. The road goes on forever. Life goes on forever. Generations will go on. Yep. So what did you have there? At that point's where we mesh. So I sit to myself in my poor little pickled Dalton brain, and I say to myself, why the fuck is this popular? Why the fuck do people like this? There's something I'm missing here. What the fuck am I missing? Why do people like it? Let's see if there's anything religious about it, because that tends to be the big kicker. There's some kind of religious symbolism that people somehow identify with. That makes it big. Think to myself, pickled Dalton. Where is God in this? Because there, there's an opportunity missed to make this either a great ploy for atheism, because what kind of God would put the people through this? That would be nice. Or a great ploy for Christianity. This is the trial that yeah, every man has to suffer through to prove their worth to God. And then we get to the fucking end, 
where the man dies, and we have a very religious, uh, a Christian themed going theme going on here, where the man dies and the son waits with for three days. The man is shrouded. You mentioned that last week, and where does the fucking son go? Oh, his only son is passed on to be raised by, by this son, kind man and woman. By the son of man. He, he by will the be son the son of man. of man. Yes. What the fuck is the fire then? The fire's fucking religion. It's hope. It's Christ. That's where we matched at that point. So we are right on that. The fire is fucking religion. And that's what this is all about. The good guys have the moral, intrinsic morals of good Christianity and hope and faith and all of that. And that is the fire they carry. And that is what keeps them separate. And that is what they're carrying forward. And that is why it is critical that we continue this journey. This long uh, long journey to deliver the sun to the people. Yeah. Now, the whole part you had about uh, Elijah, that was gorgeous. Never even gave that a second thought. I, I, I think we meshed when we came to the fire as Christianity. Yeah. Um, I think that's definitely what's going on there. I think there is a little bit of confusion there with the symbology. I think that you have to look at the sun, the boy, as the Christ character. Yeah, right? absolutely. When he meets up with this other family, they have a son and a daughter. Is that also going... F- so, obviously, you don't want your son and your daughter having babies. That would lead to problems. True. But you've got an Adam and Eve situation with the boy and the other family's daughter. Okay. Right? Right. So you have to imagine something might spring forth from that. Um, you've also got the idea of... So if the man in this represents God, God is dead. But God is eternal. I will always be watching. Yep. You can always talk to me, and I will always answer. And uh, his spearhead, his figure that he is giving upon the world is the boy. The boy must be delivered. And in the boy, we see the good moral values that we see. Why aren't we clothing him, Papa? Why can't we uh, give this man clothes? Why can't we feed him, Papa? It's that whole idea that the Christian values are passed on to the boy. It it, it fits well. Now, with the last bit about the brook trout, bless you. Because I read that and I sat down and I said, what the fuck are you doing, Cormac? This is the pretentious part. What the fuck is going on here? Yeah. Uh, But no, I I think your explanation of that does solidify this. That's what we're looking at. Well, even if we're talking about covenants, God represents the first covenant, the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Christ would represent the new covenant, the second testament. Or the New Testament, the Second Covenant. I think you're leading forward into a third world, right? Where you're expecting another covenant. We can see these things in the text. Staunch old father, right? Mm-hmm. That's the Old Testament. What happens when the guy steals their food? I'm going to kill him. No, he's not going to kill him. Eye for an eye. But I'm going to take everything you got, pal. Yeah. You, you, you want to take my stuff? I'm going to show you exactly how it feels. Okay. What happens when a guy shoots him? Shoot him back. <laughs> Son <laughs> of a bitch. Testament. Uh, what is the boy saying this whole time? Well, he's just a little hippie. Forgive him. He's just a little hippie. Can't you, can't you forgive him, Dad? Son of a bitch. Can't we move on, Dad? So again, last week I said, you know, what we're going to come to is like, I have a feeling we're going to be on like the same page with this, but we're going to have like the Adrian Master thesis versus the holy shit moment with Dalton with like the water that, yeah. It's, I, I would think we're close to the same page here. Yeah, it, it, and there's just there's so many things. So why do we, how many times, again, how many times does the father wash the boy? Often. As often as they can find water. Yep. Um, what do we, where do we finally find safety? It is subterranean. Okay. And we have to leave, don't we? We can't stay. These are false things. We cannot keep them. Throughout this as well, just from my broad spectrum, thing, and now we're just getting to the point of fucking spitballing because I'm mean, like, God damn it, things fit everywhere. Uh, in the most base sense, what are we in? We're in a world of darkness. And we have to light and we have to lead it. I, so, yeah. 
everything is fucking fitting, and I'm I'm not seeing an issue with this as the time. The world is dark. The, the world, world is, is literally dark. dark. Yeah. We have to send the light. Yup. Son of a bitch. I, I'm trying to like just dig more. Uh, there is the scene where the boy gets incredibly sick. I'm n- I can't think of anything with that besides I, possibly like the sufferings. Yeah, I mean, you could. I'm. I'm sure there is something to be made there. Um, we also have the scene where the father finds the boat, right? Okay. We're fishermen now. But what is the mess? What is the question from the boy? Are there any fish out there, Papa? No, I doubt it. I doubt there's any fish. Tell you one thing that the father always takes a moment to comment on with the boy. Uh, and this is seen when we go subterranean. This is seen when we are on the ship. Uh, those tools are awfully important, son. Make sure you keep your tools handy, young carpenter. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's so much going on here with that that it's it's very naked. Yeah. I, I, I think that, that that's the best explanation for this. And honestly, what I was trying to fucking argue before this is a thought that came up is I wanted this to be a, an anti-religious text. Uh, sure, I think that's the way that I think that's the way you lean when you see a world such as this. Absolutely. Where is your God in this? Uh, because a God is referenced from time to time. It's very just you know passive. There's nothing huge there. Uh, but where is your God in a world like this, uh, where people are running rampant when there is no hope and everything's completely abysmal? Um, but no, that, that's what stems from it. Well, and if, if you want to if you want to get into things that are sort of funny, um, this Old Testament, the Father. What is he constantly worried about? What are you eating? What is one of the things that atheists always make fun of the Old Testament for? Oh, you can't eat pork? Really? Mm-hmm. You, can't, you, can't store your sh- you can't store your pork with milk? You can't store your beef with milk? You can't eat shellfish? Really, these are the things, these are the wisdoms your God passed down? And the, the dad in here is constantly worried about what are you eating? The tomatoes all make sense yeah. now. Everything makes sense. I, I'm just there's there's got to be more symbolism built through this that we're just missing here. Oh sure, oh. yeah. When we get to the first bunker, the first time we go subterranean, we're literally going into the depths of hell. We see the deranged. We see the ravaged. We yeah, see that it's the dark place. It's the dark place. Okay. And and what is what is it a what is that manifested from? What is that manifested from? Yeah. What would you say? People without God. Okay. You, you lose... You don't have the light. You don't, you have, don't the have the fire. This is what happens. Yeah. You end up in a basement somewhere, but that's not what happens to Literally us getting torn guys. Literally getting torn apart. Yeah. We're the good guys. Yeah. And we can't save them. Another thing that we often... We can't save them. Constantly. That Another thing that atheists often make fun of religion for is that... So how did you, God needed to save people from something he knew was ha- going to happen anyway, because he's all-knowing. He knew it was going to happen, but man fell. So to save man, after the fall, you send your son to sacrifice to yourself, to forgive yourself of their sin. Right? I think an interesting note could be made as well if we want to look at like a cataclysmic world ending events. We have the flood, obviously, the big bull flood. We're looking at pretty much the polar opposite with yeah. this, a world covered in ash. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else you want to say about this? I think we've put it to rest at this point. Yeah, I think that's pretty much it for me. You want to give it a rating and review? Because like, I lowballed this. I gave it some bad rating. I gave this 65 dead demands out of 100. 65? I didn't realize we went that low. I thought yeah. we went to 80. No. I thought 80 was the low on this. I gave it 80 cans of fruit. <laughs> I, I, we usually don't go lower than 80, but like, it ain't good. No, it's hey, not. There's nothing good about it. Uh, why would you think 80 was the floor? We never go lower. It's not good. I mean, I guess we're going like letter ratings. Like, yeah, I'd give it a 65 because I'd put this below average. That yeah. makes sense to me. I don't fucking know. We never go lower than 80. We're usually really nice about things, but like, yeah, you're right. You're caught up in the religion of this, not the spirituality. Oh, excuse me. You're caught excuse up in the me. religiosity. Stigmata. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, what would you recommend uh, beyond the Bible, apparently? The Martian by Andy Weir. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. a story of being alone on a planet. And using your wits to get by. Um, he's 
that character's an atheist, I think. Okay. So you've got the difference okay. sort of in, in, in how we're dealing with things. And at least the Martian has sense of humor. Uh, it's not good. I, I, I do regret this one a little bit, but I, I, I haven't... I, I want to go back and revisit this text because I think I like it. But now that I've finished the road, I probably don't. All the Pretty Horses, also by Cormac McCarthy. Uh, okay. Cormac thrives in that Western theme. It is a little more... It, it's not like dark gritty, but it's Western gritty, so it kind of works with his writing style. Uh, from what I... I enjoyed it when I went through it. Okay. Didn't finish it, much like The Road. <laughs> uh, but be my suggestion. How do you recommend a book that you didn't finish? I'm allowed to Well, do because that. I didn't finish this one either. Exactly. <laughs> finish this out here, please. Uh, it is ironic to me that on the back of this, Entertainment Weekly calls this the new classic. No. Like the New Testament? I'm done. Uh, so this is what we do here on Strip Coverlet. We review a lot of books. We do relongs for a lot of books. Uh, and if that's what you enjoy, I would appreciate it if you hit the like button, maybe hit subscribe to stick around. And if you'd like to help us make more content here on the Strip Coverlet, there's a link to our Patreon, as always, to be found in the description below. Hello, BookTube. Well, you've done it. We've traveled down the road together. <laughs> we have enjoyed week after week of a raucous read-along of Cormac McCarthy's Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Road. And now that we're done with the read-along, uh, the time has come for a review. You will be seeing a review that Adrian and Dalton will do on their own channel, Strip Cover Lit. Uh, I'm hoping that in the course of this read-along, and now with these joint reviews, you will subscribe to them if you haven't already, because you should. <laughs> you should. I'm hoping that goes without saying. Uh, but now that we're done with the read-along and with the running commentary, and I admit, it's been fairly brutal. Uh, I confess, at the beginning of all this, I was expecting Adrian and Dalton to sort of be on the side of the road and of Cormac McCarthy and of Dude Bro Lit in general. And uh, instead, they gave it a bare knuckled reading, just like I did. Uh, but now that that's done, we are going to tabulate. We are going to review this book. So it, it, we start off any review with by telling you what it is. What is this thing? This is a 2006 novel by Cormac McCarthy. He has a long string of novels under his belt. This one won the Pulitzer Prize, and it is a departure from the rest of his work in that it is a post-apocalyptic story. It's not set in, in the American Southwest. It does not involve handguns. It instead, it is the story of a man who is unidentified and his son, who is also unidentified, who have survived an unidentified but a fairly severe post-apocalyptic event that has left the world empty of crops and traffic and clear skies and most people. Technology doesn't work. They are proceeding south down a shattered road, pushing a shopping cart full of their belongings and dodging from time to time roving bands of cannibals and other unsavory figures. This is a, a lawless, fallen world. And the man and the boy are, differentiate themselves from that world by saying that they are the good guys, that they are carrying the fire. Carrying it where is not clear. And the purpose of their traveling down the road instead of settling somewhere and hoping for the best, as they get repeated chances to do, including the discovery of a miraculously overstocked hidden larder full of the food and supplies that they desperately need, since they are often hungry. Uh, instead of doing that, they are traveling constantly moving down this road south towards uh, presumably gentler climbs and also towards the sea. Uh, and their travel is overshadowed by the fact that the man is sick and getting sicker. He sometimes has coughing fits so bad they, dr they drive him to his knees and make his vision swim. And that circumstance doesn't get any better once they start encountering real obstacles, including violence that affects the man directly. Uh, and all of this leads to a conclusion uh, that is every bit as sketchy and ambiguous as the rest of the book. So it's safe to say, although it's not satisfying to say, that if you are a reader who enjoyed the setup of this book, the first 250 pages, you will very much like the ending. Uh, and that is, that is the road, and what's left for us to do is assess how it does what it does. And we'll try to do this without reference to any other Cormac McCarthy novels. <laughs> we'll try to, try to stick just with this book. So first, uh, we're, we're going to want to talk about uh, the plot. And the book doesn't have a plot. What I just described is its plot, uh, which is also its premise and also its action, which means that there's a problem. 
uh, the, the plot is that the man and the boy are traveling south, and whatever happens to them is what happens to them. <laughs> there is no rhyme or reason. There is no scheme to it. It's just, it's, it's a road thing. It's, it's, a, it's a road thing. So there isn't a plot. There's just a series of things that happen to these two that could have not happened to them. There, there's, no, there's no interconnectivity between any of the things that happen to them, nor do any of the things that happen to them precipitate any of the other things that happen to them or reflect back on any of the things that have happened to them. By the time they are 30 pages away from leaving that well-stocked larder, it's, they don't even seem to remember that it ever happened, and no one else seems to think that any such thing could be. They certainly don't ever entertain thoughts of going back to what they know is a completely um, endless supply of food and water. So, uh, so in terms of plot, on a scale of 1 to 10, we're going to have to give this book a 1. There is no plot. So then we'll move on to characters. Uh, and unfortunately, the book has no characters. I know that I've been talking about the man and the boy, but they're just people. I mean, they're, they're upright walking things that you can describe as doing A, B, and C. But in terms of what literature describes as a character, neither one of them exists. The, the man, we don't know anything about him on page one. We don't know anything about him on page 100. I mean about him, not about things that have happened to him or things that he remembers, but about him. And we don't know anything at all about him at the end of the book, either. We never learn anything about him, and he never changes. He's exactly the same the whole time. Same thing with the boy. We don't know anything about him when he starts. He's a cipher. He's, he is, he has no, what the fashionable word would be, interiority. Except that he seems to be hysterically afraid of unpredictable things. And that is not even satisfying on its own because it is a sign of authorly ineptitude rather than the reverse. Because the, the boy is is nonsensically afraid of inconsistent things in exactly the same way that the man is nonsensically confident about inconsistent things when he shouldn't be. So it, it's not just that neither character is a character or has any interiority or grows or changes in the course of the book, it's that they also don't make any sense at all from start to finish. You never know what they're going to do because the author has never sat down to think out who they are. And that's pretty clear. So. Uh, so when it when it comes to character, we're going to have to say a one out of ten. Then we talk about pacing. We, we our next category here can be pacing, and the novel's pacing is terrible uh, because long stretches that in which nothing happens at all except that the man and the boy are very close to dying of cold or hunger or thirst are treated with the same length and the same degree of focus as long stretches when things are happening, when they encounter a mysterious blind man on the road or armed resistance or whatever. The, the pacing is exactly plottingly identical in all those cases. It doesn't change at all. Uh, and again, this is because no thought was put into it. No, no craft was, was brought to bear on shaping this story. Instead, it was just sort of told. Uh, so with pacing, we're going to give it a one. Uh, and then we next can talk about uh, craft, language. Uh, and as I've mentioned, as we as has cropped up, I'm not the only one who's mentioned it, Adrian and Dalton have as well, as cropped up in the discussions in the read-along of this book, uh, the prose is maddeningly inconsistent. It, it clearly wants to signal to the standard dude bro bare minimum is nothing you know a uh, red checkered tablecloth uh splitting your own wood these are the things that matters real men don't think real men don't ponder real men don't involve any kind of nuance and scorn it when they see it uh instead it's red checkered paper cloth on your table it's uh you know i'm gonna go out and hone a, an axe or something like that so we are forever getting uh just blast long lists, droning lists of quotidian details about how, how to open a package or or what precise steps the man takes to keep the boy warm in the order that he takes to keep them. Never what he thinks about it, just the order of things that he does or what or if they're going to hide their shopping basket. We get every single thing they do in order to do that. We're not told they hide it. We're told every single enumerated step of how they hide it 
as if those things mattered. They don't. They don't. The only reason we're told those things is because of an authorial tick of uh, dude bro lit, which is that men itemize. Men care about such things. Men care about such things. This literature not only never features women, but it clearly isn't for women either. It, it, it operates on idiotic, sexual, sexist stereotypes. And, and that is 90% of the prose of this book. The other 10% is absolutely laughable Baroque purple prose that that bursts up out of nowhere for no reason and attributable to no one. In other words, it's Cormac McCarthy that's, who's doing that. The book doesn't have a, a narrator as such. And we only get glimpses of anything inside the man's head. So it's not him that's bursting occasionally into these, into these lyrical passages about the commissaries of hell. Instead, it's just the book. And for that not to be controlled, for that to happen at all, is literally a freshman writing class mistake. And instead, in this book, it's not only it not only happens repeatedly, but the votaries of this book consider it to be high art. They don't, they don't look away or try to cover it over with embarrassment and point to the parts of the book they do like. Instead, they point to those things, which are manifest failings, with pride. <laughs> so, so the prose all throughout is alternates between mind-staggeringly boring or distractingly Baroque, with no explanation for either one. Uh, so in terms of prose, we're going to have to give the book a one. Uh, and then the last thing that we'll consider uh, will be dialogue. It's a, it would ordinarily be way up higher on my list of things, but there's almost no dialogue in this book except the dialogue between the man and the boy. There is more dialogue uh, once we get a couple of other characters much later on in the book, but for 90% of the book, the dialogue is between the man and the boy, and the dialogue between the two of them is stultifyingly dumb. It's not the minimal talk that would exist between a father and a son who, had, who were traumatized and who were on the road working for their survival. It is not that. It is an extremely comfortable, late middle-aged man, writer, imagining what that talk would be like. <laughs> a, 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 someone who has never engaged in even an afternoon without meals let alone put himself in a position of <laughs> the the dialogue is absurd it's it's not minimal it's not minimalist it's absurd i'm right here i know you are you can see me i can see you okay 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 <laughs> passages like that they sound like parody and yet they occur all throughout this book so i almost to the point where i wish in the course of reading this book and then rereading it Something that I never wish about fiction, almost to the point where I wish there was no dialogue. <laughs> so in terms of dialogue, uh, we're going to give this book a one. Uh, and the only other thing, the only other quality, I won't put it on a number scale, but that would be the overall uh, feel of the thing, the, the overall uh, reading satisfaction of the thing. And th that it's hard to put a number on that it's it but uh it fails completely <laughs> it fails completely when you go if you are going through the misery of such a thing like this you want satisfaction at the conclusion it doesn't have to be a happy conclusion but you want some kind of satisfaction something or other something to let you know that you're reading a work of fiction as opposed to reading just random jottings in someone's journal and that very much does not happen instead this <laughs> the the, uh, the overall plot structure of this thing is a total failure. Uh, so if so, when it comes to reviewing this book, I know a lot of you like your number your number grades or your Goodreads thumbs up or your stars or whatnot. I don't usually review books in any kind of quantitative manner like that. I don't I don't the idea of giving a book three stars out of five is anathema to someone whose job is to be a book critic. Of course, I don't want I if if you have thoughts about a book then then you don't want to reduce them to not to numbers to a number of stars or thumbs up and if you want to know the thoughts of someone about a book then you don't want to read that you you don't want you want to read those thoughts you want to take the time to learn what they think that is book reviewing as opposed to book rating uh but in the interest of team play and because i have a feeling that, that uh that's the way things are done on booktube uh we're going to come up with a, a number grade for cormac mccarthy's the road uh, and when I when we tabulate all of the, the different categories that we've talked about, it turns out 
that on a scale of 1 to 10, Cormac McCarthy's The Road gets an, a negative 11 million. So that's bad. <laughs> So, so that's how we're going to wrap things up. This is that is my review of Cormac McCarthy's *The Road*. It is an embarrassing failure on every level, and its its rating is negative eleven million. Uh, so that's uh, that's it for now. <laughs> Thank you, BookTube.